What's up everybody? Welcome back to our series about Kratom addiction and trauma. So over the next couple weeks at least, we're going to get into how trauma affects the brain. And like I was saying on last week's video, I get really into this kind of stuff and my hope and my intention with these videos is that we can learn more together about how trauma affects our brains. And I'm hoping that this can shed some light on why we think the way that we do, why we act the way that we do, um, how our Kratom addiction has played into our lives after experiencing trauma, or it can be any addiction for that matter. Um, so this, because it's such a heady topic, I'm going to be reading from my notes. So excuse me if I am looking down and stuff. Um, as we're going over this throughout this video. So, okay. Trauma and the brain. Trauma greatly impacts the brain. Uh, a brain scan taken of children who have and have not experienced neglect and trauma shows a great difference between them. And I wanted to show this to you because I thought it was kind of interesting. So, literally on this brain scan that was taken of a three-year-old child. Um, this is the normal brain, and this is the brain of the child that has experienced extreme neglect, which is a form of trauma. And as you can see, there's a difference in the sizes of the brains. So it literally affects um, the growth and the development of our brains when we experience trauma. And this is taken of, like I'm saying, a, a small child. Um, so there is an impact on the development of the brain when we experience trauma when we're gro growing up. It does, when trauma is has a, been experienced in their older years, it affects it in different ways, but it still does affect um, the growth and the reasoning and the cognitive ability of our brains when we experience trauma at any age. Um, so, okay, last week we went over just like a rough overview of the parts of the brain. So we're going to revisit that today and dive a little deeper into this. So last week we discussed the three main parts of the brain, and that's going to be the brain stem which this is the first thing that is formed when our brain is developed in the womb. And this part of our brain is responsible for things like our respiratory system, our digestive system, the function of our internal organs. So it's something that we don't know that our brain is doing any of this, but this part of the brain is responsible for all of those functions in our body, our heartbeat, our breathing, those kind of, um, you know, really crucial, important parts of our body. That's what this brain is responsible for helping to function. Um, then we get into our limbic system, which is the part of our brain that's responsible for our emotions, uh, the fight or flight response. Um, this part of the brain is formed in early childhood. And this part of the brain is often referred to as the foolish brain because it's the part of our brain that um, doesn't really think things through. And it's responsible for these primal emotions like anger and fear and those types of things. And so um, it's called that because it refers to when decision making is made from this part of the brain, it is often um, foolish decisions. And that leads us into uh, the last part that we're going to cover today, which is the prefrontal cortex. And this is the wise brain. And it's responsible um, for thinking things through, reasoning, uh, types of thinking like long-term planning, um, weighing out possible outcomes of our decisions. So this part of the brain finishes forming in our late 20s into our early 30s for some of us. And um, it is, like I said, referred to as like the wise brain. So when one experiences trauma, um, the limbic part of our brain activates. And this inhibits the growth and the maturity of the prefrontal cortex.
So this can affect uh, our life in a lot of ways. It can, it can affect many different things that end up playing out in our lives. Why is that? Um, that's because when we are not using this part of our brain that is responsible for this mature thinking, um, we can often find ourselves uh, in different aspects of our lives that are not good. Um, the decisions that we make end up playing out into the consequences that follow after them, good or ba bad. And we, when we're functioning from this limbic part of our brains, we're not able to make mature, rational decisions. And so this can affect um, our, our relationships, um, the way that our life plays out. You know, we may not progress as much as somebody who has not experienced trauma in their lives because they are literally able to make wiser decisions than we're able to make. Um, this also causes a lot of distorted thinking. Um, this ends up playing out into all or nothing type of thinking, black or white type of thinking. And this is very common for one who has experienced trauma that we see things as all good or all bad. And we have the tendency as well, this is actually a symptom of borderline personality disorder. As I've learned more about this, um, this diagnosis, it's been kind of interesting in how it's shed light onto some things in my life as well because um, borderline personality disorder uh, is stemmed in childhood trauma. And borderline personality disorder, it, it's, it's not, um, it shouldn't be confused with uh, disassociative identity disorder, which is like the split personality, like that kind of stuff. Um, borderline is a personality disorder that manifests in different types of behaviors and not saying that if you've experienced trauma that you have this diagnosis and i really don't just just a little personal disclaimer um i'm not a medical professional obviously but i personally have gone through a lot of aspects of the mental health system over a lot of years and i found that these diagnoses are really just labels at the end of the day and the dsm which is the uh what what medical professionals refer to when they're diagnosing has grown exponentially over the past like 20 years especially into being this huge list of all of these um, psychological diagnoses. And a lot of these diagnoses didn't even exist 20 years ago. So I don't find a ton of validity in these diagnoses. I'm not disregarding if you do have a diagnosis, but for me personally, um, my own experience is that I've been given um, different diagnoses over the years and um, you know the whole DSM oops hit my banjo the whole DSM has grown over the years and included all of these other diagnoses so I really don't um, I don't find a lot of like you know concrete information how do I articulate this I don't think that it's good to be labeled is is the what is what I'm trying to say. So we can find value in some of the information that is given about these labels, but I don't think that putting ourselves in these boxes of these psychological diagnoses and labels is the best way to go about this. But what I was going to say is that with borderline personality disorder, that's one of the symptoms of it and one of the behaviors that's associated with it is that there is a lot of black and white thinking and there can be what's called, I think it's called splitting, where one can, you know, think that something is all good and then, you know, think of that a person is all good. And then when something it happens that shows them differently, then they can split and go to that that person or that thing or whatever is all bad. And why I bring this up into 
what we're talking about is that this kind of thinking when one has experienced trauma and the roots of that diagnosis are actually, like I said, in trauma. And so this is something that can happen with us when we are one that has gone through any sort of trauma or complex trauma in our lives. And what this comes from is the limbic part of our brains being activated and us going into this very primal emotional state and going into, it's a coping mechanism basically when we go into black or white thinking because um, it's a way that we protect ourselves. When we can see that something in our own perspective is bad, all bad and dangerous, we're able to, you know, then protect ourselves from the harm that can come from it. Um, so one of the other things that comes from distorted thinking is that we will experience oftentimes when we have gone through trauma and complex trauma, um, strong emotions. And what this ends up playing out to is that we have poor emotional regulation. And this is coming again from living and thinking and reacting from the limbic part of our brains. Um, this ends up having the tendency to base choices on emotions. You know, like we were talking about with the black and white thinking, when we feel a certain way about something, when we feel that something is all good or all bad, it will oftentimes lend itself to us making choices based on the emotions that we're experiencing from that. And again, this is coming from the limbic part of our brains. And when we experience trauma, that is the part of our brains that becomes activated. Um, when we're operating as well from the limbic part of our brains, we are prone to immediate gratification thinking and seeking type behaviors. Um, because when we are functioning from this part of our brains and we are having these uncomfortable emotions that come from it, oftentimes fear, anger, stress, confusion, it becomes very easy for us to look for instant gratification as a way to self-soothe that discomfort. And that's what we got into in last week's video as to how addiction can become a coping mechanism for trauma. So um, then we're going to get into brain chemicals, which we got into last week again, but we're going to dive a little deeper so we covered the, the few main brain chemicals that happen in, in our brains, and that is dopamine, which is responsible for motivations, motivation, feelings of uh, happiness and reward. Um, then we have serotonin, which is the neurochemical that's responsible for feelings of contentment and peace. Uh, then we have endorphins, which are the feel-good brain chemicals that come um, when there's a physical pain in any way or like exercise will trigger the production of these neurochemicals. And endorphins give us like almost like a high. You know, it's talked about with like a runner's high. That's what is being experienced is uh, the endorphins. Then we have oxytocin, which is the neurochemical that's responsible for the feelings of love and connection. And it is created in our brains when we give birth, we have sex, we hold a baby, any, anything that is that um, love and that feeling of connection, that triggers the response of uh, the neurochemical oxytocin. So when we experience trauma, it affects these chemicals. So what the result is, is that we are not able to produce these chemicals normally in our brains. And thus, in turn, that ends up creating a feeling of discomfort, um, depression, anxiety, uh, negative thinking, a negative outlook on the world. Um, it oftentimes will make us feel like you know, there's nothing that we can do to ever feel okay. And um, 
this causes then in turn the production of the negative um, feeling chemicals in our brains and our bodies. And these chemicals like we've gone over last week are cortisol, which is the stress hormone responsible for flight or flight. And um, this is another thing that I want to really dive into right here because this is going to lead into in a further video down the line. Um, something that's going to be very valuable for us. And that is that uh, cortisol is also responsible for taking the, the trauma memory and burning it into our brains so that we never forget it. And so then in turn, hopefully that it'll never happen again. And cortisol is actually helpful for short amounts of time, but with trauma and complex trauma, uh, our brains begin to create continual cortisol. And um, this causes, it causes many negative things and effects on our brains and bodies. And one of them is that it literally burns out the corpus callosum, which this is the bridge between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere of our brains. And why is this important? Um, so in one hemisphere, uh, we store the details about what has happened to us from the trauma. And in the other hemisphere, we store the emotions of what has happened. So what goes on when this corpus callosum, which is the bridge in, in our brains between those two hemispheres, is that it causes triggers, which is the important thing that we're going to get into more at a later time, um, and thus, in turn, it causes emotional flashbacks. And then also, that's one side of it, but it, it can also cause us to not remember um, big chunks of time where the trauma happened at all. So this is very valuable because, as you know, a lot of us deal with a lot of triggers and the negative effects that happen from them in our lives. And so this is kind of the key to that um, in our brains, where if this, if this bridge between the two hemispheres is gone and we are triggered, what's going to happen is that there's this literal like miswiring that's going on. And we can have things like these emotional flashbacks, which are something that when I talked about um, the healing crisis in the second video into this series, I talked about how I was experiencing incredibly real flashbacks from things that I had gone through with trauma that I experienced when I was young. And so um, this is something that when we can kind of crack the code as to what's going on in our brains when we are getting triggered, this can help to shine light into what's actually going on. Because when we feel triggered, as you know, it's like zero to a hundred. Like we are experiencing this basically miswiring that's going on in our brains. And this, you know, these repressed emotions from that time are being triggered to the surface. So when it's going on, we don't know what's happening. And, you know, little things can trigger us. You know, it, it can be something that our partner says to us. It can be, um, for me, what I ended up learning then later on when I started to uncover this aspect of our brains and how it's affected by trauma was that the stress of the move that I was going through at that time, when I was having all of these emotional um, and, you know, these like super real flashbacks of stuff that I had gone through when I was young, was that the extreme stress of this move was triggering these flashbacks to the surface. These emotional flashbacks were like, I was literally experiencing the, motion, the emotions that I had gone through at that, eight, at that time when I was going through the trauma as a child. So that's really insightful to me. I don't know about you, but like when I was able to, whoops, let me, Sorry, my, my phone went into low, low battery mode, so I apologize about that. So when I was going through that, like I wasn't able to decipher like, okay, 
you know, this, this part of my brain has been affected by the trauma and the stress of what's going on is what's triggering these emotional flashbacks. If I was armed with that knowledge, that understanding back then, I would have been able to decipher that, okay, you know, this, this is an emotional flashback right now. And so as we, in another video, get into like, you know, like digging into what it means to be triggered and like hopefully in the process of learning this valuable information, we're able to thus arm ourselves in the future. And, you know, we'll never be able to fully restore certain parts of our brains that have been affected by trauma. But by educating ourselves in these different things and how our brains work, we're going to be able to help ourselves, help our future selves in things like decision making, triggers, how we respond to triggers, that kind of thing. Um, so it's going to help us in the future into, you know, becoming wiser, stronger people despite what we've experienced with our trauma. So that's really cool. And I look forward to getting into that more as we get into like, you know, triggers and really like learning more about that and how to, um, you know, relearn different ways and how to cope with those things. Um, but moving forward, so trauma also affects the brain by wiring us for chaos. And when I learned about this, you guys, like I was like, dang, this is this is real. This is deep. It helped me so much. So um, how does that happen? Uh, it, how this happens is that to survive the trauma, we normalize the dysfunction and chaos of that trauma. So a lot of us are coming from unhealthy, dysfunctional families where there is abuse, neglect, um, addiction, all of this kind of stuff. And um, so we literally, our brain, you know, becomes used to that environment. And so then what happens, unfortunately, is that when we get into a healthy life, we aren't used to it. And I don't know about you, but I experienced this a lot in my adult life. Um, and I never knew what was wrong with me. I shared before in the healing crisis video that like, you know, I knew that there were, there were things that were wrong with me about like how I was dealing and coping with life and how my, you know, that was reflected in my relationships and stuff but I never knew what the deal was. And so this is a part of it that like, you know, when we get into a healthy life, we're not used to it. And um, without realizing it, we sabotage good things in our lives uh, and create chaos to feel normal. And when I first learned about that, I don't know about you, but with me, it resonates so much because, you know, we can sit there and wonder like, you know, why, like why when anything is good, does something always happen or do I do something to like ruin it? And this is a big part of it. Um, so those of us who are coming out of uh, trauma and complex trauma, we can have the tendency to become addicted to chaos and drama because uh, that's what we were used to. And man, that is deep. Like, sorry, I have a hair that's been like tickling me. If you've seen me <laughs> throughout the video, I'm like sitting there. I had a little hair that was tickling me, my bad. So that's crazy, right? And like why this is, is that the brain can actually become addicted to cortisol. And that's because that's what we know. And for a lot of us, that feeling of cortisol, and then, you know, we didn't explain that this time, but we go into it a little bit more in the video before that what comes after cortisol production is adrenaline in turn is created. And that's what gives us the energy for fight or flight. And, um, you know, cortisol and adrenaline, especially when you're used to it, when you don't have that feeling, it, you can feel like you don't have a lot of energy you can feel like you don't have a lot of motivation. And because the things like dopamine and serotonin are affected, then that plays into it too. So what happens is we become literally addicted to that stress. And so in that, we seek out things that will get us angry. You know, we seek out a lot of times like drama, drama, 
and we will, you know, cr create drama a lot of times ourselves because we are seeking that high of that stress hormone and that adrenaline unknowingly. And what in turn happens is that the downside of this is that our bodies can't handle all of that cortisol and adrenaline because what will go on is that when we have this continual production of these stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline, and then we have a deficit of these uh, neurochemicals like the dopamine and the serotonin and the oxytocin, then what starts to happen is that, you know, all of this stress, it literally like corrodes our bodies and our brains. And so this results in uh, a negative impact on our health. Um, what ends up happening, and a lot of us have gone through this, where um, we have a lot of inflammation, we have uh, autoimmune disorders, and as well, this overproduction for a long time of these stress hormones lowers our immune system, so we're more susceptible to different things, different, you know, viruses and sicknesses and, you know, health problems all around. So this is, a, it causes a very negative impact on our bodies when we have all of these stress hormones going continuously. So as you can see with what we covered today, there's a lot of negative impact on our brains because of trauma. And this can be overwhelming and seem very daunting as we start to learn about these things because sometimes, I don't know about for you, but for me, like, I've been like, dang, like, you know, I'm messed up, man. Like, I got some things going on with me and the way that my brain works and the way that my body's then functioning from it that are not cool. And it can be a little overwhelming to think that, like, there's been all of this damage done. Like, what can I do now? Like, how can I ever like go forward and like heal this? But um, the point of this series is that, you know, we can move forward and we can heal. Like I was saying a moment ago, there are some things that, you know, with the, with the way that our brains were formed that cannot be fully restored. But what we can do is that we can learn about these different things that are happening within us because of our trauma, and we can change how we react and how our behavior is. And thus, in turn, what's going to happen is that we're going to improve our lives. We're going to improve our relationships. We're going to improve our decision-making skills. And so there is a lot of opportunity in this, though it's difficult to look at all of the damage that trauma has done to us and to our brains, the opportunity for great growth is there. And so that's what I hope that we can do together. So next week, we're going to go into uh, how trauma affects brain function and cognit cognitive ability. Sorry, tongue twister for a second. So like how we think how we react. Um, it literally even affects our IQ. So like our intelligence level is affected. So we're going to get into that more next week as we continue to dive into how trauma affects our brains. And so I love you guys and I'll see you then. Bye.